Good evening, and welcome to our school's seventh webinar in our Civic Discourse Project this academic year. Our theme this year has been Race, Justice, and Leadership in America. I'm Paul Caris. I'm the director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University. And we are delighted to be joined this evening by prominent scholar and social critic Shelby Steele of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He will discuss his views on the discourse about race and justice in America in recent decades. Part of our school's mission is to promote civic dialogue about pressing issues of our time. And each academic year, our speaker series, the Civic Discourse Project extends the conversations and debates of our classrooms to a broader community. You can visit our website to see all of our previous lectures in the Civic Discourse Project. You also can learn about our school's curriculum and programs. That's at scetl.asu.edu. We'll have three main parts to the hour this evening. First, a presentation from Shelby Steele. Then I'll post some questions in conversation with him. And then in the third part, we'll have a Q&A session from the virtual community that is joining us. So please do type your questions for Shelby Steele using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Our colleague, Dr. Carol McNamara, will collect those questions behind the scenes and then I will be posing them during the final segment. So now to our guest. We are delighted to welcome Shelby Steele, the Robert J. and Marion E. Oster Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He specializes in the study of race, multiculturalism, and affirmative action. And he's written widely on race relations in American society and the consequences of contemporary social programs on race relations. In 2006, Shelby Steele was awarded the Bradley Prize for his contributions to the study of race in America. In 2004, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal. In 1991, his work on the documentary Seven Days in Bensonhurst was recognized with an Emmy Award and two awards for television documentary writing, the Writers Guild Award and the San Francisco Film Festival Award. Still received the National Book Critics Circle Award in the general nonfiction category for his 1990 book, The Content of Our Character, a new vision of race relations in America. Excuse me, a new vision of race in America. Other books by Steele include Shame, How America's Past Sins Have Polarized Our Country, 2015. White Guilt, How Blacks and Whites Together Destroyed the Promise of the Civil Rights Era, 2006. And A Dream Deferred, The Second Betrayal of Black Freedom in America, 1998. He has written essays for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, among many other publications. He is a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine, and he has appeared on national news programs, including Nightline and 60 Minutes. Dr. Steele is a member of the National Association of Scholars, the National Board of the American Academy for Liberal Education, the University Accreditation Association, and the National Board of the Center for the New American Community at the Manhattan Institute. He holds a PhD in English from the University of Utah, an MA in Sociology from Southern Illinois University, and a BA in Political Science from Coe College in Iowa. So Dr. Steele, I think is gonna be joining us just by phone. Is that correct, Shelby? That's what it looks like at this okay. point. Uh, well, unfortunately, our, every... guests, our guests have to look at me rather than you. That's unfortunate, but we are delighted to hear your voice. And thank you for joining us for your remarks. The floor is now yours on the enduring power of white guilt in America. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm, I may be catching my breath a little bit here from, from, uh, racing around with the computer. Uh, if I um, have any expertise at all in race relations, I certainly have none whatsoever in computers, uh, but we did our best. Um, well, I've been invited to speak uh, about, uh, basically to talk about white guilt, which is, I think, a very misunderstood term and uh, a term that's uh, uh, difficult and 
to communicate about a little cause a little awkwardness, I think in, in most people, but I think white guilt is, um, at the heart of, uh, race relations in America today. And that it's hard to understand what's going on really without uh, a sharp understanding of it. So, so let me start a little bit. I think I have about, uh, eight or nine minutes. Is that probably about right? That's just great. Thank you. Um, Okay, then that's what I'll, I'll try to run with here. I think the, the biggest moment in uh, race relations in America, with the other except the, the Emancipation Proclamation, I think is certainly one, but I think the, the, the next biggest one happened in the 1960s. Um, and it, 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 this was a period when the civil rights movement sort of came to a head uh, we had been struggling with race uh, for centuries at that point. The 1960s, I think, represented what I like to call the Great Confession. This was a moment in American history where America finally, after four centuries of, of racial stress from slavery to segregation and so forth and so on, America finally confessed that this was, a, this was something wrong and uh, needed to be redressed. Uh, and so I think it was, and when a nation confesses something like this, which is very rare, I, I don't really know of another incident where anything has happened like this. It's certainly a measure, I think, of America's greatness that it happened here. Um, but when you confess to a sin uh, on the scale of slavery and segregation, and so every aspect of American life racially segregated, blacks oppressed, denied every manner of opportunity, uh, treated as subhuman, so forth and so on. When you confess to something like that, um, there is a profound loss of moral authority. Uh, it's inevitable. Uh, and my feeling is, after thinking about this for a long time, that this loss of moral authority is uh, what has driven race relations since the 60s. Um, America, how do you conduct business when anybody can look at you and say, well, you know what you did. You've now admitted it. It's it is, it's on the record. There's no doubt. This country is, uh, as, as we see many people today, is grounded in the evil of, of racism and so forth and so on. White guilt really is not a feeling of guilt. It is simply enduring this loss of moral authority. One minute having it and the next minute understanding that you don't have it. You don't have the, the authority to enforce in society the kinds of values and principles that you once did have the authority to, to do, but the, the confession now sort of deprives you of that. Uh, and so America has functioned since the 60s without a really firm and clear moral authority. When I was a young kid, I grew up in segregation, in a segregated world, in Chicago. Every neighborhood was segregated. Every school was segregated. Uh, everything was, was segregated. Uh, and people would explain, the whites would explain that to me saying, by saying, it's God's will. Um, it's, it's, people like to be with their own kind. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a natural thing. Maybe it's, it, it's your tough luck that you were born black, but uh, <laughs> there we are. Um, uh, and and it, it, slavery, racism does not in any way compromise our moral authority and our, our determination to run society and, and establish the rules that we want to. It doesn't, it doesn't weaken us in any way. Well, after the 60s, that was gone. Uh, and the civil rights movement, I think, gets credit for accomplishing that. I grew up in that movement. My parents were involved in it. I did the demonstrations and so forth. When we went out on a demonstration, 
we had to wear a shirt and a tie and a jacket. And before we were allowed to step into the demonstration, the march, uh, we had to we had to agree that no matter who attacked us, no matter who injured us in any way, we would never fight back ever. We would never return to blows. We would never resort to violence. We would instead go limp or stand in a, in a stolid sort of way. And what we would do is offer moral witness to whatever our complaint was. That, it was a great movement. It transformed the issue of race in America into a moral issue. It was not a moral issue before that moment. When I was a boy, nobody gave a good you know what about the fate of black people. Uh, blacks were just too bad on their own and, preju and, and oppressed. Um, today we anguish if the numbers for college admission of blacks are not healthy enough or not what we want them to be. Uh, we worry about blacks, uh, their, their sensibility on campus, whether they need safe spaces. We, we fret over this kind of thing. Are they going to be triggered in some way and, and, and feel some, some anxiety about functioning on a campus of, uh, with, of, of largely white people? Um, so it's a, it is a, uh, a, a, a very different, very different situation. White guilt is the compulsion that was born after this uh, confession to prove our innocence of it, to say, no, it does not represent the real America. We are better than that. Uh, we can prove that. And of course, right away in the mid 60s, President uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, came forth with every kind of social program, basically without saying it, directed at blacks. Um, he he uh, uh, created a, the Great Society, the War on Poverty, school busing, public housing, um, on and on. And uh, one huge program after another, by this time, trillions of dollars have been spent on these, these, these programs. Uh, <clears throat> Why did that happen? My sense is, again, it was, it was white guilt that drove those programs. It was the, the sense in the American people that we have to redeem ourselves. We did these people a horrible thing. We treated them in horrible ways. We have to redeem ourselves in order to have political legitimacy. Uh, if we don't do something, something redemptive, then it, 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 it diminishes our legitimacy and, and our right to, to conduct society in a, in a, in a healthy way. Uh, and so white guilt uh, was this, is in its very essence, this pressure to prove innocence of racism, of all of the old uh, evil sins that America committed earlier in its history. Um, <clears throat> And so white guilt, as, as um, I think, I think is, is, today is, pretty, is still underrated. We still don't understand how huge it is, how powerful it is. <clears throat> I looked this morning, it's Wall Street Journal's long article in corporate America um, that they're hiring blacks at a, as fast as they can, but they're not able to keep them. Uh, that they they uh, don't don't stay around long don't don't really join finally fit into the corporate world the corporate model. <clears throat> the implication being somehow that there's something wrong with American corporations that blacks are not thriving there. That's the that's the white guilt interpretation, uh, and keeps the problem within the framework of of white innocence and white guilt. <clears throat> that's the way affirmative action works. That's the way, again, all these social programs uh, have tended to function for the last uh, 60 years now. The remarkable thing about these, the, this, this white guilt-driven social reform, <clears throat> excuse me, is that it all failed. 
it's one long, uninterrupted exercise in, in failure. Um, blacks are farther behind whites today in all, by almost every single socioeconomic measure uh, that we know of. <clears throat> they graduate from high school, college at lower rates than, uh, than every other group. They have the highest dropout rate in college of any other group. Uh, you go into any medical school, most of the medical schools, you, you in the freshman year, you will find many Blacks, but then by the end of that year, many are gone, but, um, and, and many are at, who remain are at the very bottom. White guilt-driven social policies have nothing to do with Black development. They have to do with white innocence. They are about white innocence. They are about what opportunities for whites to show um, themselves to be innocent of uh, those sins of the past. Um, <clears throat> and so they are about recovering the moral authority lost in that confession. Um, I'll leave it to others to judge whether they've, they've succeeded in any way or to what degree they have or have not. Uh, but that's what the programs really were about. Uh, we didn't care whether they worked. We, in, in the film I just did on, on Michael Brown, we look at the pruitt Igo housing, public housing uh, in St. Louis in the, back in the 60s and so forth, the 50s. And, you see these huge skyscrapers built as public housing for poor blacks, uh, but then they don't allow any men in the, in the families. They, men have to leave the building, have to leave the premises. So it begins this sort of long uh, process where you, you destroy the people, the families that you claim to be helping. Well, mostly, most of the social reform, if not all of it, since the 60s, has done precisely this, has created, therefore, a huge Black underclass. When I was growing up, there was no Black underclass. There were people who were poor. I was one of them. But there was no spiritless, sort of nihilistic underclass of people drifting around inner cities across the country with no direction, often illiterate, uh, in the modern world, unable to find a way to survive and thrive in the modern world. Yet we have on the other side, all these sort of white guilt driven social policies uh, that are supposed to be lifting these people up. Why did they fail? Well, I think they committed, then I think my, my time may be up. <laughs> they, <laughs> they failed, uh, they, they, they all failed, um, Again, because they were about um, uh, the struggle with innocence in white America rather than the development of people who had been held down for four centuries. If you've been held down for four centuries, you're going to be underdeveloped. You're going to need to, to take on the challenges of, of, uh, of taking on values and development of skills and taking on uh, principles and so forth that allow you to thrive in modernity. Uh, all of these social programs, trillions and trillions of dollars worth of them never did that. And so blacks <clears throat> are today worse off. Whites ironically are doing pretty good. Um, there, there's probably, they did make true moral progress uh, since the sixties. We do understand racism to be wrong, to be an evil. Uh, and that is a moral, a cultural and moral development advancement that <clears throat> is certainly for the good. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, I, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. While you're, while you're looking for a glass of water, I, I um, will um, um, make my own small confession here. I was not expecting to pose this question to you as the first follow-up question, but listening to you, I'm, I'm struck by an analogy uh, of all people to Malcolm X that seems to me what you're arguing is that 
the dominant discourse about race relations in America for many decades, but now in the early part of the 21st century is too focused on the needs of whites and on the yeah. emotional needs of whites. And contrary to the intentions of the white majority, again, these are all freighted terms. What does it mean to be white in the, you know, what does it mean to be black? But um, the, the dominant discourse is self-serving the majority whites in our emotional needs. I'll put myself in the category white. And it's not yeah. adequately, a Malcolm X might say, it's not adequately focused on the needs of however defined black people and actually concretely, practically helping black people. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I, I think it's- uh, I, mean, I'm, I know I'm, you don't agree with Malcolm X on a great many things. <laughs> no, I, I agree with him on, uh, on many, many things. Um, okay. the, the late Malcolm X, not the early one, but the late one. Um, what Malcolm saw, I think, is what so few people see. When you come forward with these kinds of social programs that really are about uplifting the moral uh, the, the, uh, of the larger society, you, you are stealing the thunder, the, the sense of agency, the, sen the feeling that I'm a person, I determine my own fate, my fate is in my hands, my fate has something to do with the way it's connected to the way I live. Um, what all those programs said to black people is, listen, we don't trust that you can improve yourself, that you can develop. We have no faith in your ability to do it. That's why we're going to give you all these crazy things that we don't even bother to think out. We're just going to give you more welfare without any question of whether that helps you or hurts you. Um, and so... In white driven, in white guilt driven policies, are always are always blind to the humanity of the people they claim to be helping. They don't see them as human beings, as peers. They see them as inferiors. Liberalism in America for sixty years now has been based on the presumption of black inferiority, not the presumption that we're equal, that we're strong, that we're competitive, but the, on the presumption that we're a little less human than others, that we can't be expected to compete and to develop ourselves. Um, this is the, 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 the perniciousness of it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a great fan. Malcolm is the, is the only one uh, Lee, Lee, not certainly not the only leader, but he is he is the only one nationally known with who's ever voiced this this point this point of view before. And boy, is it one that that we need. But the, the reason he's he had a, he ran into trouble. I run into trouble. Others who take this point of view run into trouble uh, is is because you know blacks who are so seduced by the programs they get are going to say, you're an Uncle Tom. You're cutting us off from the help we need to thrive. And you say, well, the help you need to thrive makes you sell your soul to the devil. You, you're, you're giving away agency over your own fate, over your own life. Uh, and what, where, you, where have you ever seen in history a group do that and, and thrive? Uh, no, we have to do it. My own personal sense is we need, we need what I grew up with in the black community, a focus on dignity. We thank you very much. We, we, can't, we can't change what America's wrongs of the past were, but we're going to move forward to the future and, and uh, become competitive in the modern world. Well, thank you. I have a few more questions for you before we turn to the audience uh, questions, but a reminder to the audience, please use the Q&A function in Zoom that you can see to type questions and, and we'll be posing some questions to Dr. Steele in the third part of the program. I wanted to turn to some of the fundamental views that you have voiced in the past about what the American ideal should be regarding race relations. And I already mentioned the title of your, your 1990 book, The Content of Our Character, which invokes the phrase made famous by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in his 1963 address, that the American dream is to make 
racial distinctions a secondary or at least a harmless dimension of American life. And I should say that we ask our students to read and discuss Dr. King's address among many other uh, classic American texts about these issues. Our pocket constitution uh, <clears throat> adds uh, the I have a dream address and the Gettysburg address to the Declaration of Independence and, and the constitution. But as you well know, Dr. King's view of this ideal has fallen out of favor in recent decades. So in terms of the ideal at which you think you should be aiming, what do you say to critics who say that the, the horrible history of centuries and the persistence in the past 60 years of racism suggests it's, it's naive or impossible to think that Americans could focus on individuality and, and as you just said, individual dignity and see most people in terms of their individual character rather than all of us seeing each other in terms of racial categories. What, what is your response to that uh, skepticism? Well, it's uh, some of the problem I'm uh, working on now in a slightly different way, but it is a, it is a, a belief that identity is more important and a, a better source of power uh, than one's citizenship in the nation, in a, in a nation like America, a free democratic society, um, it's a it is the it is racism. It believes again in the atavistic. What's more, what's important is I'm black and the people and you're black, and so now we're all together, and we're going to in our blackness, whatever that may be. We're going to rise up and, and uh, be powerful in the world. Um, well, in reality, of course, it probably the, the, the opposite is true. Your, your identity is something you, you sort of embrace when all, else, <laughs> when all hope is gone. Um, and the white guilt makes, has made identity a source of power. What we do is we link the identity with victimization. We say black, the black identity is we, boy, my God, we've been victimized uh, for centuries now and so forth. And, and as a black person uh, belonging to that identity, I'm due all sorts of entitlements and, and so forth. And so I can make my special plea against the strictures of democracy. I can make my special plea in the basis of that my identity has been victimized. And so all of a sudden we become super black. We, we just black, 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 black. Because we think that's the hope. That's our hope. That's, that's the way there's power in that. White guilt says, oh, okay, we'll give you a Black History Month. We'll give you this little thing and that little Black thing and this little Black thing, and, and, uh, um, and we'll win our innocence by playing along with your silliness, your indulgence in the idea of identity as a source of power. Identity is not a source of power. If it was, my goodness, we've been, we did the whole black thing. I grew up in the black power era. I was a part of it. I confess um, it doesn't do, it doesn't make you a person who's going to thrive in the modern world. Um, it, it deflects you. It distracts you. It, it takes away from your development rather than add to it. Um, we, we must uh, instead with the, the challenge is to identify with black being black. I'm, you know, I've, I've studied black American culture all my life. I'm proud of it. Uh, I, I have learned enormously from it. Uh, I, I, anybody who wants to take the time to really look at, at it will benefit. And, and, and uh, I, I'd be at the head of the line. I mean, uh, don't get me started. I, I'll, I'll, I'll get going on <laughs> on the, the overwhelming creativity of Black Americans in the 20th. They created one of the world's great literatures in the 20th century. Uh, created, um, uh, changed, transformed music on the whole planet. 
Uh, they've done all sorts of amazing, amazing things. We don't need a month for that. That's that's all for, <laughs> you know, I want to join the world. I don't want to just be an isolated ghetto. We can, you know, we, we, but when we get confused by identity, identity kill is such a consolation that it confuses us. And we, we again, miss the, the real challenge, which is development. I don't know if I answered your question. No, that's very helpful. I suppose it's. But a, I, I, you, I, there was one point you made that I wanted sure, to. Sure. That we become um, people who are somehow beyond um, bigger than uh, a, an ethnic or a racial uh, identity. Uh, I'm all for. I'm all for that. My biggest collective identity is the United States of America. This is my home. I was born and raised here. I've been through the good and the bad. This is my country. I am. I want to make it. A, I want to make it a better country. That's my identity. That that I am black is like a religion. It's my private matter, private business. It's. I don't want to necessarily keep it from other people or inflict it on other people. It enriches me. So as we have a separation of church and state. I, for one, would love to see a, a separation of identity in state. Your identity should count for absolutely nothing in the public affairs of a democracy. Uh, it's something that you privately take responsibility for and enrich yourself by and in whatever ways you can. And as somebody who's from another group, if I see something in your group I like, I'll be enriched by that. We'll really begin to have a melting pot. Uh, but we have in the last 60 years elevated this idea of identity uh, to the point where it's, I think, really, really destructive. So again, the premise there would be given, given the constitutional amendments after the Civil War, given the super legislation, so to speak, of the 1960s, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, given some other important pieces of legislation since that are oriented toward the the ideal we we interviewed uh, Glenn Lowry a few weeks ago right the 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 American ideal of racially transcendent humanism right if 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 we accept as the premise that these constitutional and super statute changes have occurred then you could say race should not be the primary anybody's primary identity in the public sphere or public policy it is important as a as an individual choice or community choice to celebrate a particular racial identity, um, but that the focus on it is not productive. And I want to emphasize, it's not productive for individuals of a racial minority group, you're saying Black Americans, if it's the focus of your public identity as well as private. Yes. Identity. Yeah, you, you, you've been seduced. Um, and, um, you know, what is important is, is is your national identity, your larger identity. This is, you know, you and I as citizens um, have to live by the same laws. We have the, um, uh, the same rights, the same uh, responsibilities. Uh, I, can, I can hold you to them. You can hold me to them. Um, we have a mutual interest. Uh, if we join the army and go to war for our country where we fight together, no matter what our backgrounds are, so forth. That's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's freedom. That's what it's called, freedom. What we have with identity is tribalism. The idea that the tribe is the truth, is the atavistic truth. And that, that somehow, if we, if we can, uh, the tribe has to negotiate peace or, or the terms by which we live with, with these others, even though we're, we're citizens of the, of the same country. Well, it's it's uh, tribalism is a is a again a kind of desperation that that uh, never works out particularly uh, in America, uh, a free a country as free as this. So, just to follow up on the the new development of white guilt as now white fragility. Um, is it your view that even if elite institutions, you said corporations are hiring black Americans, especially in recent years to try to overcome 
what's seen as systemic racism and persistent racism in a systemic way against black Americans. Um, even though elite institutions, corporations, universities, others might be adopting this white fragility thesis or an anti-racism thesis, your, your argument is it still won't work as a collective American approach to race relations, e even if elites um, adopt this view because it's still too divisive and, and um, yes. in your term, uh, tribal. We, we won't overcome the legacy of racism if we keep on this path, no matter how many elite institutions adopt this, this view. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think, um, you know, the, the idea of white fragility is in itself inherently racist. You know, it's, it supports a larger system that, that um, uh, it supports the idea that, that the, the ethnic collectives are somehow really, really as important as national citizenship. <clears throat> and they're not. If, if you come here because you want to be a Burmese person, you probably, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be a struggle. Um, and w the presumption, sh sh and has, has been until the 60s, the presumption uh, has been that if you come here, you want to assimilate. Um, well, now here we get into a very dicey area when we're in the area of race. Assimilation is, oh, that's a, a forbidden thing. That's, that's mimicking white people. That's mimicry. It's, it's, it has ugly connotations to it. Um, and yet the Blacks that you see who are very successful, let's begin with, with President Obama, uh, are speak eloquently are assimilated uh, in every way uh, to a, an international kind of norm uh, of, of excellence and, and of values and so forth, and are at the very least successful. Uh, yet in the inner city, in many inner city schools, we're back on the, this, the drumbeat of identity. Your, your blackness is what's important and what has to be respected and what has to be treated as something sacred. And, and it's what's going to, to uh, make you transcendent. Um, no, it's going to keep you backward. You, unless you learn how to really mesh, bring it into the modern world. Uh, and that's, that, that's, not an easy, that's not an easy thing to do, but it, that's what the black leadership should be doing, bringing us into not a white world, but a modern world, into modernity itself. Our problem is that we, under development, keeps you out of those, uh, those avenues. Uh, we need to be in them. We need a leadership that, that will actually explain that, that joining modernity is not being an Uncle Tom. It's being a fuller more expansive human being. So a final question from me before we turn to audience questions. You've been critical of affirmative action as you just were in your earlier remarks and, and in your writing for a long time. So I, but I just wanna get a little bit close to home. We're coming from a public university. You would be of the view that in response to George Floyd's death last summer, the movement across higher education to basically double or triple down on affirmative action policies, including in targeted hiring of, of faculty only for uh, you know, black Americans could apply for certain faculty positions or doubling, tripling down on affirmative action programs in other ways. You, you, you don't see those as ultimately paths for success either for the individuals or for the institutions or for American society generally. Was was segregation um, okay? With it, <laughs> uh, 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 did it enhance American society? Did did slavery enhance American society? Did it is it has to be understood that race is, racism, racial divisions, no matter how we dress them up, um, are empty. They don't they don't carry any meaning. Uh, in and of themselves, that I'm that I'm black doesn't really mean much. It means 
you can presume certain things that I've experienced certain things uh, um, in my life that, that people who aren't black didn't experience, but that doesn't really get you very, that doesn't really get you very far. Um, and so I think, you know, that is the, uh, um, <laughs> I've been being distracted over here a little bit. Um, the last sentence you, 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 uh, you mentioned. Could you mention that one again? No, well, I, just, I think you gave an answer. I'm actually going to turn now to audience questions because as oh. usual for our, our community, we've got some terrific questions. I'm going to begin with, uh, with our, our friend Jim Stoner uh, from Louisiana, basically asking the question, are you saying, Dr. Steele, that um, race can be a positive and constructive element, for example, in thinking about the, the past and thinking about culture, but it shouldn't be a central element of public policy and thinking about America of the future. Is that a fair way of for formulating your, your view? I, I think the, the, the danger, nobody ever picks up race, the matter of race, without seeking using it to seek power. It has no other existence at all. It, does, it has no inherent meaning. It's empty. That's why it's so beautiful as an evil. Uh, it can be used by anybody. The lowest among us can, can feel better by being a racist because racism is so empty, so bereft of, of, of positive meaning, of any meaning at all. And so it's it's just it's an outgrowth of of the of the the human desire, the human need to have power over other people. And whenever anybody uses it, that's what they're doing. Every single time, there are no exceptions. It never is different. Affirmative action has been a disaster for Black America. Um, all these young, to, I was so fortunate. I came along just a few years before affirmative action came in. So I never ran into, I ran into, I had to meet the same standards of other people and I couldn't go to certain schools because my test scores were this. I went through all of that um, and nobody ever, uh, in, when I was in college, in graduate school, nobody bent the rules for me. Or, uh, uh, nobody was invested in me succeeding because I was black. I was lucky. I was lucky. I, I went to school. It was perfect for me. I went to, I got a great education there. Um, the, the, again, that's white guilt, social reform, because it, affirmative action helped. Well, we, whites can then say, well, we send them to school. They're, they're at the top. You know, my kid can't get in there, but black kids can. Look how good we are. And yet the blacks are struggling when they're in there. They're not, and they doubt themselves. Many have used the term with me when I've spoken on campuses. They, they will say to me, because I didn't, I, I came along before affirmative action, they will say to me, you're the real thing. You think about how chilling that is. I'm the real thing just because I, I, the, the, the white man didn't, didn't touch me. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't boost me along, put me in a little bit over my head so forth it's it's my my point is is that this kind of reform is the most virulent the most vicious kind of racism because it it, it engages the sympathy of the of the victim it makes these college kids think they're getting something special because they're black and then you'd have to tell them years later that being black is not special there's nothing special in being black or being white. Race is empty. Uh, why, why can't we accept that? Because we all, in some way or another, want power. So if I can't use it this way, I'll find another way to use it. But I'm, I, I'm not going to take that out of my race, out of my trick bag. I, I need it. And so universities, corporations, the government, all rush to it and find ways to use it to seek power. Then nobody leaves it alone. It's too inviting, it's too tempting. So people will say, well, I use it for the good, not the bad. No, there is no good. 
anytime you use it down the line, usually very quickly, you will run into corruption. You will, you will face a corruption. Now you've got a generation of black college kids in self-doubt, haven't had an opportunity to prove their own worth, their own dignity. You stole that from them, telling yourself you were wonderful in doing so. Would you do that to your own kids? Uh, it, no. It's race is never ever, and that's the, there's we have to apply. I'm, in my feeling is a, a certain absolutism to it. It's it, it can never be entertained. It'll it will take you, you know, to hell in a in a handbasket very quickly. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to uh, uh, skip over some questions that get at various aspects of that <laughs> response and shift to a question from our friend uh, Peter Myers, who we interviewed earlier in this series in the fall, a uh, uh, scholar expert in African-American or black uh, political thought. We did a session on Frederick Douglass. Peter was one of our mm -hmm. guests. Uh, Danielle Allen was the other. So he asks, um, setting it up, you were, Dr. Steele has been eloquent about all that can be learned from the black contribution to American moral and political thought, intellectual culture, especially Malcolm X. His specific question, could you say a word about Ralph Ellison? What oh, Ellison yeah. means to you as an author, a literary figure, a political thinker. How much time do we have? <laughs> we, we only have about 10 minutes. <laughs> I have a pantheon of, of three, the, my top three greatest writers who have, uh, for me, that, that have ever that lived. Sal Bellow was one of them, V.S. Naipaul is another one. And at the very top of the list is Ralph Ellison who uh, taught me virtually everything I know, uh, whose work I have absorbed, who, who really ha helped me understand race in ways that um, I never came, came close to understanding before. Um, Ralph Ellison was his own man. Nobody gave him anything. He transformed himself from a poor black kid growing up in Oklahoma City to the man who I believe wrote the greatest American novel ever written, The Invisible Man. Some people would say, no, the greatest was Moby Dick. Well, you can quibble. I'll, I'll take Invisible Man. I think it was more complex. I think it was richer. It looked, it looked uh, more deeply into the human conditions than uh, even than Moby Dick, which is obviously a a flawless, magical piece of work. Um, but Ellison gave me a sense of, of the, the range of black of possibility for people, for Americans who were black. I grew up again in segregation. It was nice to know, to, to see. I liked James Baldwin, the early James Baldwin very much. Uh, and still admire, have, a, have a, a strong affection for, for Baldwin's early work. Uh, but when you look at, at, at Ralph Ellison in the sense of the, the irony at the heart of the Black experience from the opening of Invisible Man on, I'll, I'll, I'll get lost here <laughs> and, and start lecturing, but um, he, he showed me how the black experience fit into the human condition. He didn't do it the reverse. He said, no, blackness is special and I'm gonna show you how black people became, they'll be improved if they become, go with black power. He didn't do that. He said, no, you know, we're, we're, we're human. Every single thing we do is human. Black people do all kinds of things. Whatever they do, it's human. And you approach that culture, you approach Black people as you approach Irish people, as you approach anybody, as human first, uh, even as they're expressing their ethnicity. Uh, they're being human. Humans do that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, why? And And... So in under, looking at the black characters in Invisible Man, you, be, you are enlightened about uh, human, the human experience. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm going to shut up there because <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. Uh, I, I just well, am a, a, a great admirer of that man. That, that is uh, great to hear. I'm going to try and sneak in two questions here, each of which you could spend 30 minutes on a piece. But uh, a, a, an audience member is asking, are there any constructive social policies you would recommend to address race relations in America? Or are you, in effect, saying we just need to not have social policies about race per se, that would be the best path forward. I certainly would say that we should not have race policies uh, uh, per se. Um, what was the first part though? You mentioned- Well, just, you know, you, you were critical of, you've been critical of many oh, yes, social yes. and political policies that yes. focus on race. Are you saying there really are not any race focused policies in, in public life uh, in, and even in you know, major elite institutions, even if it's a private university right. in Harvard? Um, or, or are there some that would be constructive? But I think your answer is there, yeah. there really are not. I think, the, I think that the test of, of, uh, of social policies uh, always is, for me at any rate, what they ask of the people they're claiming to help. We know white, the first mark, of white guilt social policies is that they never ask anything of the minorities that they're claiming to help. They never ask. They never say, we'll give you this, but it's on the condition that you achieve this. They just say, we'll give it to you. Well, you know, when they give you, people give you something like that in human affairs, they're, they're dominating you, that they're they're treating you as an inferior, as somebody they have complete control, on and on and on. Um, you, you, if you're not asking people with social policy, then you are oppressing them. You're giving them no opportunity to, to be great, to show you how, how, how talented, what they can do. Uh, and you're condescending and patronizing um, and you, te you just teach them to manipulate you. You don't, you don't, um, and, and again, institute, suppose we had said to people who got who, with affirmative action, uh, well, look, we'll give you affirmative action, but you have to have a, a B plus average. You get a B average, you're out. Because we're interested actually in you developing. And if we just give you affirmative action and you come into the university and you go straight to the bottom of your class and you stay there until you drop out. That's the note. That's what we've done. That's white guilt. White guilt doesn't care about you. It cares about being able to say it gave you affirmative action. Um, so let me finish with this. Several questions are, are asking if in effect, you are suggesting we should be focused in the area of culture or not, not laws, not public policy to produce a healthier racial relations in the United States. What are some particular constructive steps in the area of, of culture or individuals or, or institutions that are not government institutions? What would you recommend? Don't move ahead in American life as a black or as a minority, move ahead in American life as an individual American citizen. What makes sense for you? Who are you? What do you love to do? What are your interests in life? What would be fulfillment to you? Who do you know who's actually living in a way that would be, that would be attractive to you? Um, the, the matter of, of being black uh, should never enter your mind. Should never enter your mind. Then you'll be what God uh, enabled you. You'll be a unique human being. But if you, if you waste time trying to fulfill some collective obligation to blackness, then you'll, you, 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 you will, you'll fail. You won't succeed and you'll, you will have wasted an opportunity. Um, so I, th this, th there's, in other words, there's, there's, there's my, my rule of thumb is there's no magic. There's no magic really in life. You make your life and it's going to be whatever you make it. Uh, the, and it's, and there are no miracles, you know, that we, 
the heavens just don't open and make you this or make you that. You, you have to live as a free individual, which is a blessing uh, in a society that is people from all over the world want to come here to do just exactly what you have the opportunity to do. What do you want to do? Uh, and uh, so that message would come through cultural institutions, educational institutions, but it would come from everything. Every it, government it, policy or a, don't tell me when I go to school what religion I should follow, and don't tell me anything about what I owe my race. Okay. You don't. I don't want to hear it. And then let me sneak in one last question, since several audience members are asking this question. You did talk about your views about white guilt and white fragility and the new the anti racism movement, but um, we didn't specifically talk about Black Lives Matter. So a few questions are coming in the queue about okay. that, your, your view of the Black Lives Matter social political movement. I wrote a piece on this. I, uh, what fascinates me about them is <clears throat> they identity is everything to them blackness uh, and and so forth. Um, they believe deeply and absolutely that blacks are victims of systemic racism in the United States of America, that that's our fate and that that's who we are. When you believe that the center of your identity is victimization, um, then you, you put yourself in a situation where you, you begin to live like a victim. In other words, you become a victim. You don't think for yourself anymore. You just conform. You go along with what, what other seems to be popular, what other blacks are, are doing. And of course, then again, white guilt will encourage you in, in, in that. And so you try to make a life out of, out of protest and victimization. It's impossible. You can't, you can't. And so, and so therefore you, and you feel inside as, as I, I wrote, you feel in, uh, inauthentic. If you don't, if you're not a real, uh, as a black person, you, you feel inauthentic if you're not a victim of racism. So you literally celebrate victimization. You, you scream it from the hilltops. You judge your, your peers <clears throat> on how, how deeply ensconced in victimization they are. <clears throat> and we're wasting it. Black Lives Matter is wasting another generation. We should be freeing each other as individuals. Go for it. You want to do this, this interest, you follow it. Go for it. Learn. Go to school. Get, get yourself trained. Get, get, a, get a life that makes you happy, that makes you, gives you self-respect, self-respect, um, that you're black, don't waste your time. Uh, of course, we're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna born that way and you're gonna die that way. Uh, there's, 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 you got that covered. It's, it's uh, you know, you, that's in the bag. You're, 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 you, you don't have to worry about doing anything special to be black. Um, the, the, uh, be bigger than that. And, uh, Encourage your, your peers to be bigger than that. That should be the, 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 the um, you know, the beck and call of, of, of young Blacks, it seems to me today, is this enormous. Uh, they're virtually drowned in possibility and, and opportunities that just are un, un, inconceivable to me when I was a young, when I was in college and so forth. They're now wide open. Well, oh, boy. Um, Celebrate that. Well, thank you. I regret we have run out of time. I have a few um, closing remarks before I give you a final word of thanks. Uh, so thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us for this seventh webinar in our theme this year in the Civic Discourse Project on Race, Justice, and Leadership in America. We ask you please to check the video catalog on our website. That's skettle.asu.edu. We have recordings of uh, the first six webinars in the series, ranging from discussions about George Washington, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, to my discussions with contemporary writers on race relations in America, Randall Kennedy of Harvard Law School, our annual Martin Luther King uh, lecture event with Thomas Chatterton 
Williams, my discussion with Glenn Lowry of Brown University. And in just a day or two, we'll have the archive of this discussion with Shelby Steele. You can also check our website for information on our final event in the Race, Justice and Leadership series coming uh, next month. We'll be having a discussion about Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. My uh, colleague, Adam Seagrave from the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership will be serving as moderator for that session. So as always, I thank our colleagues in the school who made this webinar possible, Dr. Carol McNamara, Joe, our Associate Director for Public Programs, Joe Martin, our Communications Manager and our Zoom Wizard, and Morgan Raddick from our events team. Great thanks again to Shelby Steele, our guest for sharing his expertise and his insights. Thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight. Be well and good night. Good night, thank you. Thank you so much.